welcome, welcome. Welcome to everyone at home. Welcome to our panelists. It's so, so exciting to be here with both of you. Um, I'd like our audience to know that we're live both on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, you can share this event uh, by going to facebook.com slash Canada Policy, which is the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute's site. Um, I just want to welcome you all, wish you a good evening. We're joined live today by journalist Camila Escalante and author Eve Engler. My name is Bianca Bajeni and I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, who are the organizers of today's event. And you can find out more about our work at foreignpolicy.ca. So the Institute is based in Montreal, um, which is on the traditional territory of the Ganyangehaga people, um, the keepers of the Eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, today, I also wanna thank our, our co-sponsor, uh, CLAA, the Canadian Latin America Alliance for helping us to spread the word about this important discussion. Um, as usual, our chat is open um, and we love to hear from folks at home. Um, see lots of you have joined us. That's great. There's already more than 100 folks on the call. Um, and please, uh, please do say hi. Keep your comments cordial, of course, and free from har harmful commentary. Um, today's event will be an hour and a half long. Um, hi, hi. It's, it's so it's always so wonderful to hear from people in the chat. Hi, Steve and Christian. Hi, Yuri. Hi, Gordon. Um, so after our speakers give their uh, opening remarks, um, we will then uh, hand it over to the audience for a Q&A. Please do post your questions in the Q&A uh, chat box, if at all possible. Um, so that's kind of located at the bottom of your screen and it's easier for us to find your questions there than it is to find them in the chat. Um, so again, my name is Bianca Majeni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. And um, we're an organization that challenges unjust Canadian foreign policy measures and aims to bridge the gap between the reality and perception of Canada's role in the world and also seeks to uh, oppose the racism that we believe is embedded in our foreign policy. And our organization is reliant on uh, our community to keep going. So please do consider donating or becoming a sustainer at foreignpolicy.ca slash donation. And I'll be putting that link in the chat today and, and, and lots of uh, other links for, for action, resources, and so on and so forth. So please do be checking the chat for that information. Um, so for tonight's event, um, the collapse of Trudeau's Latin America strategy, um, you know, I want to just sort of acknowledge, you know, before we start that, you know, this is a pretty, yet another, you know, fairly perilous time in human history. And I know that, um, you know, what we've we've all got a lot on our minds right now. Um, and, you know, we should be coming together uh, to address the overwhelming urgent crises of climate, the pandemic, militarization, inequity and more. And yet the world is moving further away um, from peace and from the conditions that are needed to solve our most pressing concerns. So Ukraine is on most of our minds today. And this is a conflict that Canada has participated in escalating and militarizing. And, um, and while the CFPI focuses overwhelmingly on Canada's foreign policy, we do think that it's important to state, you know, that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is devastating. You know, it's a violation of the UN Charter and that's taking us all down a dangerous path. Um, and yet our role in Canada is to call on our own government to support peace and de-escalation, to refrain from fanning the flames of war um, which, which, uh, which Trudeau has been doing and to prioritize diplomacy over militarism um, from Europe to Africa to the Caribbean and Latin America. So tonight's talk will focus on the rise of the left in Latin America and the liberal government's efforts to bolster governments that undercut the regional integration efforts that have shaped Latin America between 2005 and 2015. And we'll also be addressing the ways in which the liberals have sought to overthrow uh, leftist government governments in places like Venezuela and Bolivia, um, and the resilience of these governments. So, uh, with uh, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to uh, to uh, to to introduce you to Camila Escalante. Camila is a TV news pr uh, producer. She's the editor of Causa News, Press TV's Latin America co correspondent and former presenter at Telesur English. Welcome, Camila. 
Hey, thank you, Bianca, so much. Thank you so much for the invitation and thanks to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, you guys have been doing um, awesome work. Oh, Cam Camila, you're still muted. You're on mute. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Bianca, and thanks to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute uh, for inviting me. Uh, you guys have been doing lots of great work and I've seen um, over the past uh, year or so uh, the, the work you've done in uh, you know, bringing consciousness about uh, some of the issues um, in Latin America and Canada's foreign policy towards Latin America. Uh, I've been following some of the things uh, that have been going on in Canada um, recently, and so um, I've been a little more plugged in than I would normally be. Obviously, my eyes are normally here in Latin America. I'm based in Bolivia. I'm currently in La Paz, um, and so you know, I do feel like um, as a Canadian citizen, I, I grew up um, in the United States, but I am Canadian. Um, that it's very important to highlight the ways in which uh, Trudeau and his administration have been actively involved in destabilizing uh, Latin America. So I want to talk about some what some of the types of intervention are that we've seen um, or what would be considered intervention uh, by a state like Canada. We have full scale invasions and outright war. That would be the one that we don't really see a lot of. We see mercenaries sending lethal weapons and military equipment. That's something that should be on the top of the mines of Canadians right now because of the half a billion dollar loan sent to Ukraine by the Trudeau regime and money that was previously uh, sent to Ukraine in January. We see funneling of millions or billions of dollars for war specifically or for forces to destabilize a country or region. We see funneling of millions of dollars to opposition groups, opposition parties, or figures in order to manipulate political outcomes, to create turmoil or unrest, and destabilize a country. That's something that should be very familiar um, to anyone who's followed the situation of Venezuela. And this all goes hand in hand with a blanket propaganda uh, war that is disseminated virtually through all major media networks on traditional mediums and through new mediums and online platforms, contested only by outlets which have very little to no resources or funding, such as my own, Kasachi News, um, and the other outlets that I've worked with. We have a hell of a job trying to contest uh, the outright lies that are propagated by those who only work to, to disseminate this misinformation and these campaigns that are completely, um, you know, adopting and carrying forth uh, the, the, the lines of the Trudeau regime. And then of course, sanctions, economic trade and financial blockades, unilateral course of measures. By definition, these are unilateral course of measures because they're not issued by the United Nations Security Council. Canada is currently illegally sanctioning countries because it is imposing these sanctions, these financial, economic, trade sanctions on countries which are not sanctioned by the UN Security Council. That includes Venezuela and Nicaragua. These are unilateral uh, sanctions that are being imposed by Canada, by Justin Trudeau, um, jointly with the United States in order to starve the Venezuelan people into submission in order to, uh, to, to create unrest for a coup. Um, and so these are sanctions which you and I, all of us, uh, most likely on here, um, are all subject to. We're all, um, as citizens of Canada, the United States and Europe, we're obligated to comply with these sanctions ourselves. Um, otherwise, there are penalties uh, for us as well. Um, I think it's really important to say that Canada is a war-mongering state, um, given the context of what's going on in Europe today. And it's constantly opting for provocation and not for a diplomatic solution. The things that we see Canada doing in Latin America and other parts of the world 
are not characteristic of a state of a government that is seeking a diplomatic solution, sending billions of dollars to, to destabilize other countries or, you know, in the case of what was announced a few days ago, half a billion dollars in lethal weapons to Ukraine is not characteristic of a state that is seeking a diplomatic solution. And it was not the case that they were seeking some sort of diplomatic solution when they uh, went against the democratically elected constitutional government of Bolivar in Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, and tried to oust them. It's very important that people know that what they're saying in their tweets and their statements from Foreign Affairs Canada or Global Affairs Canada, that it's completely false. These are all statements that are virtually copied from the United States, from the US State Department, and you know, which we believe are not reflective of the Canadian people but which harm, you know, cause harm in Latin America and around the world just the same. So some of the crimes more specifically that Canada has committed in Latin America is the formation, you know, its integral uh, role in the formation of the Lima Group. Uh, you know, the Lima Group sought uh, the ouster of uh, the democratically elected government of Venezuela. They wanted to oust uh, President Nicolas Maduro, but also the governing United Socialist Party of Venezuela. And so this is a horrible, shameful, um, uh, you know, a, a shameful act that, that has been carried out since the beginning of the Trudeau regime. Um, but it's also how I know that Canadians um, and people in Canada and North America are plugged into what's going on in Latin America because we did, after some time, begin to see some resistance from citizens there saying um, you know, that these sanctions are cruel and that they constitute crimes against humanity because of the way in which they make it impossible for the people who are in charge in those governments of getting food, medicine, and vital supplies of getting those things to citizens made it very difficult for a period of years. Thankfully, Venezuela is now recovering, but made it very difficult to live in the country and force a lot of people to seek economic opportunities and a better life in other countries. Just yesterday was the three-year anniversary of the February 23rd, 2019 uh, Cucuta Bridge invasion from Colombia. Um, if you'll recall, this was, um, you know, a false flag attack that was planned uh, from the United States. Um, you know, Marco Rubio, senator in the United States, had a lot to do with the planning of bringing in uh, trucks full of what was supposed to be humanitarian aid, but which was a lot of dinky things such as surgical masks and rubber bands and nails, um, wasn't really anything that could help people, but they were going to try to force this cargo into the Venezuelan, through the Venezuelan Colombian border with the help of uh, you know, the Colombian armed forces, um, without the permission of the Venezuelan state, it was an invasion. And, uh, you know, the Venezuelan people had to fight this not only on the ground with the uh, Bolivarian National Armed Forces, but also uh, the, the propaganda war that was taking place there that was saying that Nicolas Maduro, the president, and his own people burned the aid. We found out that this wasn't aid at all that it was just a bunch of junk in a truck and that the Guarimbas themselves, those people who were working with Colombia and the United States burned their own so-called humanitarian aid. This is something that the Canadian government uh, supported. And it's a very scary thing that, that, uh, that has taken place in our recent history because it's been a very long time since we've seen outright invasions such as the invasion of Granada and of Panama by the United States and that sort of bombing and war. We haven't seen anything like that. I would attribute that to the consciousness of the people of Latin America and the Caribbean, but to have something like this happen and to have so much support behind it is a very eerie thing to have happened. Um, more recently, we've seen, um, uh, we, we've seen interference in the form of statements by Foreign Affairs Canada on the arrests and the prosecution of Cuban rioters uh, following the protests and riots that took place in July 2021, so just about six months ago. 
Uh, this has nothing to do with Canada. Um, you know, Canada has absolutely no stake in that. And Canada, just like the United States, just like Europe, uh, goes around uh, rounding up protesters following demonstrations all of the time. Um, and it's absolutely not the place of Canada uh, to, to make these interventionist statements as it was making towards Cuba just about two weeks ago at a time when protests were taking place in Canada of a very large magnitude, relatively speaking, compared to what was going on in Cuba. So they have absolutely no place. And my warning to the Canadian people, to anyone watching, is to look out for the ways in which this hostility is being increased against the government of Cuba and this sort of turn towards a more hostile position from the Canadian government of Justin Trudeau towards Cuba, which for so long have had an amicable uh, relationship. This is something that Christia Freeland and Justin Trudeau are trying to change now. And there's a lot of pressure on them from Washington to do so. Uh, you know, Canada has also been involved in and supported coups in Honduras and Haiti. And, you know, obviously the Canadian US joint sanctions on Venezuela, um, you know, this is a model that they're going to be replicating in other countries, including as we've seen in recent months against uh, Nicaragua. Um, but you know what Bianca asked me to speak about, I'll try to rush through this. Despite this, Latin America, both its governments and its uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, both its governments and ma mass parties, its social movements, um, social and political organizations are defying these outside source forces and they're overcoming these attempts to undermine Latin American sovereignty and their own national sovereignty in each respective country. Last week, Wednesday, the Russian deputy prime minister, Yuri Borisov, began a tour in which he visited Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba for high level meetings to discuss trade and economic cooperation, which will undoubtedly contribute to the advancement towards the construction of a multipolar world. Um, so, you know, all of this activity and these, um, these different uh, cooperation uh, projects, as well as the, um, the, these countries uh, integrating into the Belt and Road Initiative of China, um, is all taking place. Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Bolivia are all part of, you know, their beacons. They are developing strong socialist models and economic models, which are already in development. Um, they're examples for the rest of the continent. But there's also a second tier of countries, Mexico, Argentina, many Caribbean states, and now Honduras, uh, Peru, and Chile are also um, you know, increasing South-South cooperation and have the freedom and the confidence more than ever to reject these meddling attempts and state their positions even when they're disfavorable uh, to Washington. And the majority of them have resumed diplomatic relations with Venezuela. I think this is a very um, important development that shows that um, you know, there's only so much influence uh, that the US uh, can peddle around this region. Um, you know, on the state of social movements um, in the region, it's always been the case that even when uh, we, we've been subject to the worst of right wing uh, governments in the region, social movements, particularly the Campesino movements, indigenous movements, um, and a lot of others as well have been, uh, you know, building very important um, bridges across the continent. Um, and we're also um, seeing the revitalization of integrationist mechanisms, specifically ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance, which has been largely revitalized thanks to Sasha Llorente, the Secretary General who is a Bolivian. He was, uh, he was a, a diplomat under Evo Morales here, and now he is the head of ALBA and is really bringing together not only these you know, socialist countries in Latin America, but also uh, a number of CARICOM countries. And we also um, have seen the, the restarting, the reboot of CELAC. These are very important mechanisms. Um, and uh, you know, we hope to see the revitalization of UNASUR as well. But um, we are finding ways 
Latin American and Caribbean countries to trade amongst themselves, to build cooperation um, and partnerships with countries overseas in, this, in the global south, in Africa, in the Middle East, um, and of course, uh, Asia and Russia as well. And so these are the ways that we're overcoming, um, you know, this complete collapse of a strategy uh, by the US and Canada and their European allies. So I'll, I'll let uh, Eve take the way and come back for the questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Camilla, um, for that excellent uh, overview and um, just for being so clear and passionate in your presentation and for all the incredible work that you've been doing over the years. I wanna um, encourage everyone to find out more about Camila's work and uh, Kausishan News. The link is in the chat there, it's kausishannews.com. They're also on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and uh, Camila will be joining us later for the Q&A. I see there's lots of questions for her in the, in the chat and the Q&A, so she'll be back. Um, I just wanna remind people to put your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much. Can't wait to catch up with you again, Camila, for the Q&A. Our next, spe uh, next speaker of the evening is Eve Engler. Um, Eve is a Montreal-based writer and political activist. He's published 12 books, including most recently House of Mirrors, Justin Trudeau's um, foreign policy, as well as his newest book, Stand on Guard for Whom? A People's History of the Canadian Military. And you can find out more about his work at eveengler.com. Welcome, Eve. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks, Camilla, for that, that great overview. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for uh, uh, being here. Um, <clears throat> when I initially uh, I heard about this event, it was, I viewed it very celebratory, right? Uh, Canadian foreign policy is, uh, is damaging all over the world, uh, quite frankly. Uh, wherever you look, you'll find that Har or Trudeau's foreign policy has been um, often against the interests of the majority, in favor of corporate interests, in favor of Washington. Uh, what's nice about Latin America is that they're actually losing in Latin America. Well, you, you can't necessarily say that with regards to Palestinians, or you can't necessarily say that with regards to other places in the world. But I have to say, um, <clears throat> it is with a bit of a heavy heart tonight. Uh, I think what's going on, uh, what began yesterday with Russia's uh, invasion of the Ukraine is, is a, quite a, a troubling uh, development, clearly needs to be condemned, uh, as does, of course, Canada's hands in um, in ramping up tensions within within uh, within the Ukraine, pushing pushing uh, <clears throat> uh, um, NATO right to Russia's border, having troops at Russia's border. Uh, Canada's role in 2014 in overthrowing the government, elected government in in uh, in um, in uh, 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 Ukraine is also directly contributing to. Uh, um, uh, what's going on uh, today. Um, so we will hear in, in coming days, or, or and have been hearing in recent days, many comments about sovereignty, Ukrainian sovereignty, about uh, international law, about the UN charter from Canadian officials criticizing the Russian government, uh, and, and rightfully at one level, but the hypocrisy is quite uh, quite astounding when you when you uh, broaden the lens and when you look at what the Trudeau government has been doing in different places, uh, uh, particularly in in Latin America. Um, but on the first note of the on the positive note, because I again this event I think should be viewed in, is is a rare uh, foreign policy, rare discussion of Trudeau's foreign policy that can very much be framed from a from a positive uh, direction because uh, it has failed. Um, the most clear failure of, of Trudeau's foreign policy, one of the most clear failures, is in Bolivia, right? In 2019, the Trudeau government supported the overthrow of Evo Morales. Um, eh, then they, they did so uh, uh, hours after the military ousted Morales. Uh, Global Affairs Canada put out a statement saying, quote, Canada stands with Bolivia and the democratic will of its people. We note the resignation of President Morales and will continue to support Bolivia during this transition and the new elections. Uh, Ten days earlier, they had criticized uh, the elections. Uh, of course, people probably know Organization of American States electoral observers helped sub subvert uh, Bolivian democracy. There were Canadians that were part of the uh, OAS audit mission. Canada financed the audit mission. Canadian officials uh, 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 
boosted uh, the, the OAS mission. They released a statement saying, quote, Canada welcomes results of OAS electoral audit mission in Bolivia. This is Christian Freeland speaking. Canada commends the invaluable work of the OAS audit mission ensuring a fair and transparent process, which we supported financially and through our expertise. That of course, those, those OAS uh, auditors and the whole OAS electoral mission have been completely discredited at this point. Uh, and Canada played a important role in that whole process. Um, and one year later, uh, uh, throughout the next year, when uh, uh, Janine Añez, the, the unelected uh, so-called uh, caretaker government, um, continued to postpone elections, continued to repress the population, the Canadian government was absolutely silent, justifying the, the uh, postponement of elections. And then finally, about a year later, social movements forced the government to hold elections and the Movimento al Socialismo, the political party of, of, uh, of um, uh, Evo Morales won uh, with a major, major victory. It's not that often that you see such obvious um, uh, failure of a, of a coup that Canada uh, 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 supported. So, so that's one, one, one area we definitely can, can, uh, can celebrate. Uh, uh, Camilla talked a bit about Venezuela, but we should also we frame that really in a positive light. Yes, it's been incredibly damaging. The campaign against Venezuela has been incredibly damaging for Venezuelans, but they have held, they have refused. Even those who are not necessarily supportive of the government have understand that U.S. Canadian imperialism is a far uh, 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 a bigger issue and they have, they have rallied behind opposing that uh, foreign intervention. And that intervention is unbelievable. The brazen nature of Canada's campaign to overthrow the Venezuelan government is, is, is remarkable. I mean, I think it's somewhat historic in Canadian foreign policy history. And that's not, not coming from someone who's a, you know, a myth maker of Canadian foreign policy history. Juan Guaido, more than three years ago now, the, uh, the Canadian government backed Guaido as, this, this, uh, as the legitimate president of the country. Um, as the uh, 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 Canadian press reported at the time, uh, the Canadian government uh, helped facilitate conversations with, with, with people that were out of the country and inside the country to rally them behind Guaido. Associated Press referred to Canada's quote, key role in building international diplomatic support for Guaido. And that's directly, spent months working to build uh, uh, opposition support behind Guaido, but they also spent basically since Trudeau uh, came to office in 2015, uh, working to isolate Caracas, uh, imposed four rounds of sanctions, illegal sanctions, uh, brought Venezuela to the International Criminal Court, uh, funded opposition groups, pressured Caribbean countries to support their campaign against Venezuela, as well as other uh, Central American, other Latin American and, and Japanese government and other countries around the world. Um, they, but most importantly, as Camilla mentioned, they set up the, the Lima Group in 2017 with Peru, set up the Lima Group of governments, generally right-wing governments in the hemisphere, uh, to try to uh, oust uh, uh, the Venezuelan uh, government and, uh, and it was successful, quite frankly. The Lima Group, for a period, seemed quite successful. They rallied lots of governments in the region uh, into the Lima Group. They held all kinds of meetings targeting the Venezuelan government. And, uh, and um, they were having a certain level of, of, uh, of diplomatic uh, success. Now, that has completely fallen in on itself. Um, uh, the Lima Group is basically dormant. Many countries, half a dozen countries, have, been, have left the Lima Group. Uh, 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 and what you see now, and I think we should we we should make, point out the contrast. You see that the, um, the Lima Group has collapsed. It's not meeting, but on the other side, the community of Latin American Caribbean states, which is a uh, excludes Canada and the U.S. All the other countries in the hemisphere are part of it. Uh, excludes Canada and the U.S. It is re re rekindling. Right after four years of not meeting. It is now meeting in September, a big uh, a summit, leader summit, which included the Venezuelan president, uh, um, was held in, in Mexico. Uh, uh, and that's directly uh, 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 oppositional to, to, uh, to Canadian uh, uh, involvement. And so when we, when we talk about the Lima Group, when we talk about these positive developments, the rise of the pink tide, the, you know, the new pink tide in, in, in Latin America, 
One example uh, was uh, recently in Honduras, after 12 years of a coup government where Canada played a very important role in that coup. We can go into more detail on that later on if you want. Um, uh, Ziamora Castro won uh, the election, defeated 12 years of coup government, and, uh, and has already talked about pulling out of, you know, out of the Lima group, uh, joining ALBA. Uh, rejoining ALBA. Honduras, of course, had joined ALBA just before the 2009 coup, and then the coup government uh, withdrew from ALBA, and now uh, talk about uh, potentially rejoining ALBA. Um, and, and, and Honduras was probably the clearest example of the just utter hypocrisy of Trudeau's um, uh, uh, policy on Venezuela, right? They claim that we, we got to back uh, Juan Guaido because the Venezuelan constitu constitution says that, he actually even got heckled at one meeting. He got asked a question at town hall uh, about what's going on in Venezuela. And he actually cited the, the Venezuelan constitution. And, and you had Trudeau, it's a funny clip you can see online of Trudeau acting as the uh, constitutional expert for, for Venezuela. Uh, it was of course all totally ridiculous, but Honduras was the clearest example where here you had yeah, Juan Orlando Hernandez who was part of the Lima group um, who had no, no constitutional legitimacy. I mean, he, he, he had forced the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court to, to allow for a uh, uh, um, second term of elections. The Honduran constitution was clear, only uh, one term for presidents. And that, in fact, was the re reason for the justification of ousting uh, uh, Manuel Zelaya in, uh, in 2009, was that he was going to have a referendum to discuss possibly rewriting the constitution. And they were claiming that was a power grab, him trying to, to run again, so just to have a discussion, a referendum to discuss the question. That was enough to justify overthrowing him in 2009. But here you had uh, Juan, Orla Juan Orlando Hernandez who, who gets the, uh, uh, runs in the second term, uh, for a second term, is losing by a significant margin. All of a sudden, uh, the voting stops. And when it comes back on, he's in the lead. So you had the in the Lima group this clearly uh, uh, unconstitutional uh, Honduran president that was lecturing the Venezuelan government on you know following their interpretation of the constitution and 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 Honduras's recent shift uh, from a, a hard right to a more uh, a centrist moderate left uh, government is a, a clearly a very good uh, a good uh, development. Um, and, and so, yeah, throughout Juan Orlando Hernandez's time in office, I should, I should state, the, the Freeland right away in 2017, after this totally dubious election, she immediately recognized uh, his, his, uh, his victory, um, uh, basically no criticism of uh, Honduras during the, his whole uh, term, uh, Canadian aid continued as, as normal, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Another positive development is, is the uh, Pedro Castillo's uh, election in 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 um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Peru, um, and again, that's a total blow to Canada's Lima Group coalition across the hemisphere. Um, so now Lima is no longer in the the Lima Group. The new foreign minister of Peru called Lima Group quote the most disastrous thing we have done in international politics in the history of Peru. Right, so here in Canada, you still they still boast about the Lima Group, but in the in Peru, the government's saying the most disastrous thing it's done in its whole uh, 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 history. Uh, so you have uh, more generally, you have a, a left wing shift uh, across the region. You have a, a, a more uh, centrist, leftist government in 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 Argentina. Uh, you have uh, positive developments in Peru. One thing you notice. With, with Trudeau's uh, foreign policy towards Latin America. And really they, they are hostile to Latin American integration. They are hostile to the, the pink tide, to the sort of leftish or uh, radical left, uh, if you like, uh, governments across the hemisphere. And the clearest way you see this, one of the clearest way is you, you find that their criticism of the alleged or real human rights violations uh, of left-wing governments, the one the governments that are you know challenging corporate power, challenging Washington's dominance, they have tons of criticism of their human rights violations. But then, when you have a government like uh, in Colombia or or in Honduras or in Haiti, total silence, right? When it's governments that are the you know pro-Washington, pro-corporate governments, total silence on the human rights violations, which are often 
usually substantially worse than uh, the, the human rights violations in, in, uh, in progressive governments. Uh, in Argentina, uh, Trudeau really went out of his way to support uh, Mauricio Macri. Uh, a number of visits went to, went to uh, Buenos Aires, um, uh, was uh, met with uh, Macri in a number of uh, um, uh, international summits. Uh, when he lost to uh, Alberto uh, Fernandez in 2019, the CBC labeled uh, the uh, wealthy businessman's loss as Argentinian president, la labeled it a quote, a loss for the Trudeau government. Because again, they, they were supporting across the hemisphere. They back the right, the right wing governments uh, diplomatically, through aid, through uh, different, different uh, uh, you know, public statements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, with regards to uh, uh, Chile, you see some very positive developments there where you have, uh, there was an uprising, a social uprising in, 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 uh, in the fall of uh, 2019. Um, uh, a few weeks into that uprising after the army had been called out to the streets uh, by uh, the right wing uh, Sebastian Piñera, a very uh, unpopular uh, president, uh, Trudeau had a conversation with Piñera. Uh, there had already been 19 people killed uh, nothing about violence. What, what he wanted to talk about was the alleged uh, electoral discrepancy in the, the Bolivian election. He wanted to basically justify the, the coup efforts to try to ramp up the coup effort, efforts against Evo Morales. Um, uh, but now we have a, a new, more, more uh, 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 progressive, less right-wing government uh, in, in Chile, as well as a, a constitutional rewrite process which offers some real opportunities for some, for some progressive advancements, which are, let's be clear, a threat to the Canadian banks that are dominant major players in Chile. The Canadian mining companies are also significant players. Um, uh, so you have uh, positive developments there. Uh, similarly, you have a possibility of, of a, a real shift in Colombia uh, away from this history of just you know, the, the bulwark of US power in the hemisphere, hi historically Colombia. Uh, uh, Ivan Duque is, you know, a far right uh, government, a close ally of Trudeau in the campaign to overthrow the Venezuelan government. Um, and you have a possibility of a, a more centrist uh, president looks well uh, uh, um, uh, set to uh, 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 win the upcoming uh, elections in, 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 uh, in Colombia. And I should just really make it clear that Trudeau has, he's gone out of his way to refer to Ivan Duque, the right-wing president of Colombia as, as a, you know, a feminist government and, and really tried to, to, to kind of uh, provide a, a progressive veneer to somebody who is clearly part of the, you know, the hard right uh, within, uh, within a, quite a right-wing uh, country. Um, uh, even with regards to Brazil, I mean, Bolsonaro has, has you know, gotten enough, uh, you know, he's enough linked to Donald Trump that it, he's sort of a little bit of a toxic brand, you would think, to somebody like, like uh, Trudeau, who tries to, you know, claim a sort of progressivist, progressivist veneer. Uh, but even with Bolsonaro, uh, you know, at the, at the uh, G20 in, in mid-2019, Trudeau was, was um, you know, had a nice little meeting with Bolsonaro, uh, has continued to negotiate the, uh, the Canada Mercosur uh, uh, free trade agreement. And probably most importantly, total silence by Trudeau uh, and the government, the Canadian government generally, on the persecution of, of uh, Lula, the former president, uh, who would have won the election, would have defeated uh, Bolsonaro if he was allowed to run, uh, and, and the sort of uh, soft coup against uh, uh, Dilma Rousseff, uh, the, uh, the Workers' Party uh, uh, president. Now, in, in, uh, in, um, in Brazil, you have a, a uh, it looks like Lula will win the upcoming election, um, and, and this, is real, this is really significant in terms of not that, not that the uh, Lula government was that progressive of a government in many different ways. There's lots, you know, I think very legitimate criticisms of the Workers' Party from a, from a, a, a you know, a, a socialistic perspective. Uh, um, but, but this is a major shift in the geopolitics of the region. 
if Lula wins, this will really uh, rekindle the the Latin American the inter, the, the integration of, of the countries, um, which is so important, right? It, you know, if Latin America is gonna gonna break from uh, this long uh, history of of U.S. dominance in the region, the countries in the region need to be working together, need to be building up the forums, as Camilla was talking about, like Alba, Unasur, uh, uh, Silac. Um, and, and so that I think is really important that will Brazil, uh, Lula winning in Brazil will have a major effect on that. And, and, I, and I think it's got to be really clear to us, right? CELAC, every country in the hemisphere is invited, is part of this except for two countries, Canada and the US, right? The rest of the hemisphere understands whatever different, you know, at this moment or that moment, some right wing government is allied with Canada, with the Trudeau government on this policy or that policy. They understand whether that obviously exists, but they, at a more fundamental level, there's an understanding that Canada is part of the uh, imperial bully <clears throat> in the hemisphere, part of, of that long history of US Monroe Doctrine domination of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the hemisphere. And CELAC uh, offers the possibility of replacing the Organization of American States that body that has been a you know a trojan horse of us interests in the hemisphere where canada the us are the two biggest donors uh, to the oas uh, which played this role in 2019 and subverting bolivian democracy same thing in 2000 it played a uh, oas electoral observers played a role in over uh, uh, undermining uh, uh, Haitian democracy because there was a uh, mild, mild social democratic uh, government led by uh, uh, Jean Bertrand Aristide, um, and so and so there are some shifts taking place in this hemisphere. There's many examples where the Trudeau policy in individual countries uh, has lost, has been at least partially defeated by through elections, but also at a more macro level, there's a uh, shift towards a uh, uh, integrationist uh, policies through a, a number of different forms, which is part of the long-term weakening of uh, North American domination of the hemisphere. And I think that we should be uh, very happy that uh, Trudeau's, Trudeau's policy in Latin America uh, is failing and arguably uh, uh, has collapsed. I'll leave it at that, uh, thank you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you for your excellent presentation and that um, awesome overview of uh, both developments in Latin America as well as um, Canada's policies there. So you can find out more about uh, Eve's work at eveangler.com where there's lots of um, articles, um, analysis, um, and news. So that's eveangler.com. So we're now moving on to the Q&A portion of our evening. We're gonna welcome back um, Camilla uh, and Eve to answer your questions. There's lots of questions that we've received both in the Q&A um, and uh, some, some in advance as well. And uh, this is my favorite part. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, also just wanna let people at home know one, we've had a, a bunch of questions about whether this will be rebroadcast and yes, uh, yes it will be on both uh, YouTube and Facebook. Um, you can actually sign up to uh, our YouTube channel. You can subscribe um, for notifications um, so that you never miss another webinar. All right, so in terms of uh, Q&A, um, the first question that we have is, uh, is from Judith um, and it's directed uh, at Eve, but of course you can both, both answer. How would you compare Trudeau's foreign policy with Harper's? Eve, who is the who is the uh, who is the bigger fascist? Asked Judith, and and I'm wondering how how does Trudeau's policy in Latin America fit with previous governments' policies? Uh, I mean, I think it, 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 it is. There's far more of a continuation than there's any sort of break, and that and that's not just you know Harper to Trudeau. Uh, uh, I think that the the in, on with regards to Venezuela. Uh, Harper was was actually, you know, um, far less imperialistic is the reality. I mean, Harper was hostile to the Venezuelan government, but was, you know, the 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 this the extent of the Trudeau government campaign on Venezuela is is uh, you know is quite a remarkable thing in the history of Canadian foreign policy. 
And uh, Venezuelan uh, former foreign minister Jorge Ariaza said, made that point um, uh, in, a, in a talk about Canada's policy in, in Venezuela. So, so that, you know, that's one example where, where, where um, I think it, it's substantially worse. I mean, I think part of what, to understand what happened with regards to Venezuela, but other countries, is that basically the Canadian government, the American government, uh, smelled blood. Right, they smelled a weakness in Venezuela, but but more generally in the hemisphere that there was, you know, some right wing governments had been elected in different places, and so they they saw that there was this possibility, this opening to push to really, you know, just eliminate the last vestiges of the, you know, pink tide or or any of the left wing governments and just basically wipe them out. That was the objective in in, in Bolivia, uh, obviously in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, and and just you know that I think is. It, you know, we're seeing it, that it's, it's failed, right? In fact, you know, the Venezuelan government's still there, you know, Bolivia, um, you know, returned, Nicaraguan government's still there. Um, and so, and so uh, that's, I think, one point. I think going back historically, we should also, you know, look beyond this. And the reality is, despite the mythology, you know, Canada supported, uh, Trudeau's father supported the coup in Chile in 73, Right. A, on a whole series of different ways, uh, you know, from before Allende was elected, he was already trying to undermine Allende when he did a, when he did well in a, in a 64 election. Right. Uh, uh, so so you know, if you go back and you look at Canada's role in in um, in uh, the coup against uh, 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 Arbenz in, 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 in Guatemala, Goulart in Brazil, uh, Canada consistently sided to, to varying degrees with with um, with U.S. Uh, imperialism, so so it's not something that's new. Uh, there are elements of Trudeau's uh, policy that that are um, worse than Harper's. Um, uh, I would say that Harper's, you know, sort of crass, just open backing of Canadian mining companies uh, has a, been a little bit softer with Trudeau uh, on that front. Uh, but the the broad outlines of the policy, you know, the history of Canadian foreign policy is driven by two things: uh, support for empire historically British, today American, and support for Canadian corporate interests. Most of the rest is, is, is fluff. It's, it's justification, it's rhetoric. Uh, we're trying to help the children, we're trying to bring development, all that kind of stuff. But it's about empire and corporate interests overwhelmingly. Thank you, Eve. Camilla, would you like to chime in or shall I move on to the next question? Um, only that under it's going to be under this government, the Trudeau administration, that we are going to see, like I said before, the pivot towards an aggressive, more hostile policy, a more interventionist policy against Cuba, which has been a longtime friend of Canada throughout different administrations. And so we saw, um, we heard this from Liberal Party insiders. Um, midway through last year that they were going to ramp up aggression and issue these new sanctions around the time that Nicaragua um, held its elections these um, you know at the same time that uh, legislation was being passed in the United States that Canada would do similar on their side against Nicaragua to move towards hostility against Cuba. This is something that Canadians overwhelmingly reject, but that Christia is really pushing for and Washington is applying a lot of pressure on Ottawa to do so. So yes, we see uh, the same levels and more of hostility and interventionist foreign policy towards Latin America from Ottawa under this regime. Thank you, Camilla. The next question that I have is from Douglas. Um, Eve, you already touched upon this a little bit, but perhaps um, perhaps both of you could elaborate. Douglas wants to know about Canadian mining corporations and their role as key drivers of government uh, coup or meddling policy. So I'm wondering if um, if both of you could comment a little bit more. I know both touched upon it on Canadian mining uh, as as it relates to our policies. Well, well first of all, I mean, um, with AMLO, a sort of you know mild reformist president uh, in, in Mexico, uh, there's already been conflict, a number of with, with around mining companies in Mexico, the Canadian government and the Mexican government and you know, public criticism, stuff like that. Um, Canadian support for mining companies is really uh, uh, quite uh, remarkable. Uh, there's just a recent report that came out a couple of weeks ago um, about ca Canadian uh, lobbying on behalf of Goldcore in uh, 
they got all the internal government documents, the access to information documents um, uh, uh, around lobbying for Gold Corps in 2010 and 2011 after the indigenous communities in Guatemala uh, that brought Gold Corps to the Organization of American States Human Rights Arm, which is supposed to be uh, arm's length from the OAS. And I did a story, I mentioned the, the Alan Cullum, who was the Canadian special advisor to Venezuela, which was basically the person leading up Canada's campaign to overthrow the Venezuelan government. I did a recent story where I talked about how he was Canada's ambassador at the OAS at this point. And he intervenes on behalf of Gold Corps with the, the uh, human rights body, human rights court of the, of the uh, OAS, who had, uh, who had called on the Guatemalan government to, to suspend the mine until there was um, uh, some sort of negotiated solution to the grievances of the indigenous communities who've been, who've been the people, four people have been killed, a couple dozen people uh, hurt by mine security and, and, and whatnot and all kind of ecological damage and people's uh, lands were, were, you know, uh, their rights were ignored, etc. Um, and and the, the Canadian government, just the, ex the extent to which they lobbied all around, like the whole apparatus of the Canadian government, from their offices of the OAS in Washington, to uh, you know ministers, uh, to the embassy in Guatemala, diplomatic officials on the ground. It's just like a, the level of 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 uh, of uh, campaigning is, is 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 quite remarkable, and and in a number of countries in Latin America, uh, Canadian uh, policy is very much uh, uh, driven by mining interests. Like you know, I think. It doesn't usually get that much attention, but much of what the Canadian ambassador would be doing in Ecuador, for instance, is helping out Canadian mining companies sort of navigate the, the bureaucracy. If there's any conflict that arise, you know, back them up. Sometimes they provide uh, a funding, you know, that often finance all kinds of initiatives around like educational initiatives that are, you know, ostensibly just about training people in, 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 uh, in um, you know, mining engineering or whatever, but it, it's really about helping Canadian mining companies because they're so, they're so dominant. So, so mining is definitely very important. Uh, I've written about the role of mining companies in hostility to the Venezuelan government. There's the famous comment, uh, 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 letter that uh, Peter Monk, the former head of uh, Barrick Gold, the biggest mining company in the world, where he compares Hugo Chavez to Hitler. Um, uh, and he's you know, very clear that he sees the sort of nationalistic resource policies of the Venezuelan government as a real threat, even though Bear, Bear Gold has no had no uh, operations in in uh, Venezuela, he sees uh, the nationalist resource policies as a threat to his interests because they understand that you know part of the reversal of neoliberalism, the most one of the most common reversals of neoliberalism, is uh, more nationalistic. Uh, resource policies, right? And 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 so so and there's like a hundred billion plus Canadian mining investment in Latin America. And so if one country starts going down the process of more nationalistic uh, resource policies, that can you know that can you know go all across the region. And we're talking about you know major threat to Canadian profits. So so the Canadian uh, government is definitely uh, works to advance Canadian mining interests. Their perspective on different governments is is heavily shaped by how those governments, uh, uh, how open those governments are to foreign mining companies. Um, that's definitely a, an important piece of the puzzle. Thank you, Eve. Camila. Yeah, I think that was a good, um, that was a good overview. And just to add on to that, um, you know, it's, this is why it's so extremely important, uh, you know, that the sovereign rights of the people of each country um, are allowed to go forth and elect our own our own governments um, because the types of policies that we want within our countries in Latin America are countries which favor the economic policies of nationalizing our strategic industries and national resources as they've done here in Bolivia. And if you've heard, uh, President Luis Arce, President of Bolivia, speak about um, his economic policies and the nationalization of these uh, resources and industries. He's spoken about this in English as well. So you can look that up in interviews with CGTN um, and uh, interviews with US outlets as well. Um, he speaks about uh, you know, the, the conditions under which uh, different uh, companies and uh, you know, private co companies and countries are able to come into Bolivia and make these um, agreements with the Bolivian state. 
that all of the uh, that you know all of the process has to be done here. Um, that these are um, these are goods and um, resources that have to benefit uh, Bolivia in the case of Bolivia's lithium. That Bolivia also has the capacity now to uh, to uh, manufacture its own electric cars. So if any country, if any other foreign state wants to come in and help um, and, and help exploit uh, Bolivia's lithium, that the, that the lithium and those batteries need to be able to be used by the Bolivian state to put into their own electric cars uh, to benefit the Bolivian people um, and all sorts of other conditions like that. So that's extremely important. And this is how, you know, on our side of things here in Latin America, we're combating those uh, multinational and extractivist uh, corporations. Yeah, on the subject of um, multinational corporations, we have um, we have a question from Yuri, uh, who wants to know um, two questions for Ms. Escalante. Is there any chance or pressure coming from the Mexican left um, that AMLO needs to get out of NAFTA and end the drug war? And Eve, could you explain Canada's wrong, long role in uh, colonizing Mexico and how NAFTA has badly impacted both Canadian workers and Mexican workers. Well, Eve, you can go ahead and, and uh, answer either of those because I'm not following uh, Mexico very closely and wouldn't be able to answer that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a, there's a definitely a history of Canadian uh, uh, imperialism in Mexico. Uh, there's a, the first Canadian gunboat diplomacy is actually, I think down to Mazatland in like 19, uh, uh, sometime during the Mexican uh, Revolution, I believe, uh, um, to protect uh, some some British uh, interests in uh, in uh, in the city, um, and uh, Canadian banks and and uh, and um, uh, light rail uh, electricity companies and light rail companies were players uh, in the lead up to the Mexican uh, Revolution, and uh, and were seen as. A, aligned with the dictatorship. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a history there. And then today you look at, you know, Canadian mining companies. Um, I don't know the most up-to-date figure, but at one point there was a, uh, at the time, just before NAFTA, there were no Canadian mining companies operating in Mexico. And as part of NAFTA, they, they, um, they basically changed the constitutional rules around the, the ejido system, the land ownership structure. Um, and basically that enabled uh, mining more generally and foreign mining specifically it was a series of other uh, uh, changes to Mexican laws. And you went from no Canadian mining companies operating in Mexico to something like 375 over like a 15 year period. And, and, uh, and most, of the Canadian, most of the mining companies in Mexico are, 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 uh, are Canadian. So, so, you know, Mexico is a, you know, big and relatively wealthy country. So it's not a, it's not a country that's, you know, you know, I don't, Ottawa is not just, you know, dictating to, uh, to the Mexican government in some sort of, you know, it's not, it's not Haiti, right, where the, you know, Canadian power is nothing, nothing uh, comparable, but, but still, it's a, it's a, uh, I think, um, a definitely a one sided relationship in terms of, um, in terms of uh, NAFTA. Uh, I think that if you look at the Mexican economy um, is so dependent on exports to the US that uh, uh, I don't think that um, it, it's a big hill to climb to uh, to re you know remove uh, from the whatever the updated NAFTA is called now, um, and uh, and 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 so you know I know one of the things weirdly that Donald Trump one of the sort of positive that uh, aligned with uh, that Donald Trump pushed in the updated uh, economic accord was you know the rules around uh, a more sort of uh, uh, independent unions in Mexico, and there was just a real recent victory at one of the auto factories where they they got they voted in a um, a, uh, a, um, a more you know serious uh, labor union uh, despite the the pressure for the for the uh, the sort of state controlled union, and that's something that weirdly enough that uh, Donald Trump was pushing as so, and I think AMLO was also um, uh, supportive of. Um, so that's a sort of small uh, making the uh, trade agreement between uh, Canada, Mexico, and, and uh, the U.S. Uh, um, 
better. Um, yeah, at a, at a macro level, that's the point of these trade agreements. The point of them is not to enable, uh, you know, the free flow of human beings. The point is to enable the free flow of, of uh, investment, quote unquote, investment, which is just, you know, corporations and having more ability to play off workers in different countries. And, and uh, you know, one of the ways to put pressure on uh, auto workers in Canada that are asking to ma maintain their conditions or improve their conditions is to, to threaten to leave to go to the US or to go to the go to Mexico. And the reality is the wages are, are so much uh, lower in Mexico that that's a threat that's that's real. I mean, it, it has, a, it has a, um, you know, you can make more money by uh, producing the vehicles oftentimes in, in, in Mexico. So that uh, it, it, it's, a, it's obviously a, a real threat that has a, a negative impact on um, on uh, I think working class people in all the different countries and and you know even within Mexico if you look at you know the rise of um, of uh, dependence on uh, on uh, basically exporting human beings um, basically you know remittances uh, you see that the, the Mexico's economic dependence on remittances has has grown drastically under the neoliberal period and uh, so much of its economy now is based upon you know Mexicans working in the U S. Uh, some extent in Canada and sending sending money back. I, I don't think that's a that's not a um, that's not a model of quote unquote development that is um, a, a human centric uh, model of development. So that's something that um, that I think that uh, ne you know needs to change. Um, but I don't think that AMLO. I think that AMLO. I don't know. I'm not following Mexican politics well uh, close enough to have confident opinion on, on, on either of uh, how much pressure there is to, to end the free trade agreement. I'm guessing it's viewed as uh, at least short-term economic suicide, um, uh, but also um, the whole war on drugs. I know that's one thing that a lot of criticism of how much sort of um, uh, dependence on the military uh, AMLO has and, and the sort of, uh, you know, continued the militarization of, of Mexico, and that's something the U.S. has been pushing for 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 a long time, um, uh, and I think that's obviously unfortunate. Um, it's a I, I don't think that AMLO is much more than a sort of um, a mild reformist, uh, better than the better than the main alternative, but certainly not um, uh, you know the uh, the progressive government that that uh, would be ideal. Thank you, Eve. So we're going to pivot a little bit now to um, you know, some some current events. Hans would like to know about Latin American responses to Putin's invasion. Um, so I'm wondering, um, maybe I'll start with you, Camilla. What has been the response of uh, Latin American governments to Russia's invasion? Um, well, I'm going to take a glance over at our Twitter because I I uh, published a couple of them today, um, and over the past few days, just uh, this evening, it goes Maduro. Uh, tweeted out the response from the Venezuelan foreign ministry saying that Venezuela expresses its concern over the worsening crisis in Ukraine and regret, regrets the mockery and violation of the Minsk agreement by NATO promoted by the United States. Similarly, um, this afternoon, Evo Morales, who is, um, you know, there's a lot going on here in Bolivia. Um, I have to say it's very, um, there's a lot of like national things going on here as well as local things having to do with our union that Evo heads, the six federations we're celebrating our 31st anniversary of that Campesino union. But today uh, he took to Twitter to say that war um, is never the solution. He said that uh, we're from the culture of peace, uh, that Bolivia is a peaceful and anti-imperialist country, but he condemns US interventionism that has pushed Russia and Ukraine into a confrontation saying Europe cannot become the theater of US operations against sovereign countries. I mean, I think leaders here in Latin America are seeing that you know there was just massive amounts of money that was poured into Ukraine and large amounts of uh, lethal weapons uh, and military uh, equipment that was sent there in recent weeks. And this is something that we can't ignore. Um, you know, this is, uh, the, the only reason that this hasn't happened in Latin America, once again, is because of the consciousness of the people, because of our own, uh, you know, anti-imperialist uh, reporting and media outlets and the social movements who've said, you know, that this is too far. Um, but otherwise, similarly, Europe 
uh, Canada and the United States would be arming opposition forces and destabilization, des destabilizing forces in Latin America as well. We did see and we continue to see and have seen in recent years the arming and sending of mercenaries to our shores here in Latin America. Uh, most, like most recently, um, you know, in, in 2020, the, the failed mercenary attack called Operation Gideon on the shores of Venezuela. And this was a very large, extensive paramilitary mercenary terrorist um, invasion, incursion that was being planned. And the same network of mercenaries, uh, you know, was being uh, used um, and contacted and solicited um, in order to participate in the assassination plot against uh, the former president of Haiti, um, as well as a, an assassination plot that was being planned against President Luis Arce here in Bolivia the month of his inauguration so that he wouldn't take power. We've seen all sorts of things like that taking place. So this is the backdrop, this is the context of, that we're living in. We're seeing, um, you know, uh, uh, the planned uh, army exercises carried out by Mauricio Macri, the former president of uh, Argentina, who planned, um, who, who were holding drills for the potential scenario of an invasion of Venezuela by Argentine forces coming from Colombia, once again staged in Colombia. So we know in which the United States solicits all of the different help from all of its imperialist, imperialist allies, but also, you know, pays mercenaries um, and all sorts of other uh, paramilitary forces in order to get involved with these uh, with these situations. I mean, these are other acts of war in and of themselves. So this is our understanding of the situation that's taking place there. Our understanding is that. You know, um, you know, as these different leaders have said, including President Daniel Ortega of Nicaragua and President Miguel Diaz Canel of Cuba, that we are countries of peace. We believe in non-intervention, specifically non-intervention in peace in our own in our own uh, region, but also for uh, you know conflicts that have nothing to do with us. But that being the case, this being a European war, we also see the ways in which these different um, in imperialist entities. Are, are feeding into this and are provoking a war there. And so, um, you know, all these different leaders who I've mentioned have called for, you know, peace, a diplomatic solution, and for the United States and Europe to stay, uh, and the EU to stay out of, um, to stay out of these issues. Thank you. Eve, uh, do you want to chime in? Do you have some thoughts on this? Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think I repeat it. I think, you know, the what, Russia's doing, I think war is 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 a bad thing and and the clear violation of the UN Charter. Um, uh, you know, it has it, it's really scary because the possibility of of ramping up is is real. I mean, new uh, Russia's nuclear armed country. Um, Biden, you can definitely see a scenario where Biden gets a lot of pressure uh, from the hawks within his administration and, and throughout US. Uh, political culture. And, you know, there's a push that, you know, you got to take more and more aggressive positions and that leads to funding, uh, you know, rebel groups or some sort of opposition from outside the country. And next thing you know, the US gets sort of brought into it and, and you got a war between Russia and NATO. That's not, that's not impossible. I think it's very unlikely still, but what we're seeing is has increased that possibility. And that's, you know, that's humanity probably uh, more or less uh, you know um, end of end of civilization as we know it even without that like right now with the climate crisis and amidst a pandemic the last thing we need is to be focusing on this sort of militaristic uh, 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 kind of scenario this is going to lead to strengthening the hand of the militarists throughout Canadian political culture American political culture and many other European countries etc. Um, uh, so, but so I think we have to be really clear that what Russia has done is just wrong. It's wrong in so many different ways. But also, we have to be clear that you know the Canadian government was right at this. I just published an article a few hours ago about Canada's role in in the overthrow of the elected government in 2014 in 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 the Ukraine. Right, a government that was viewed as supportive of of Russia. The Ukraine is a divided country. 
all of its elections have shown very clear regional linguistic division uh, with, you know, the sort of more Russian speaking generally east of the country uh, uh, going one way and the more uh, uh, Ukrainian speaking west of the country going a different different way. And 2014 is there's a direct link between 2014 and what happened today. That is clear, right? Um, and uh, Canada was right at the center. The Harper government was right at the center. It's actually remarkable um, how little there is, uh, there's many articles out there. It's not really sort of hidden, but you know, the, the opposition activists in 2014 were camped out in the Canadian embassy in Kyiv for more than a week. That's reported by Canadian press. Okay, so the activists that who ultimately overthrow the elected government are camped out using the Canadian embassy as a safe haven for more than a week during protests. The spokesperson for the Canadian embassy, the local spokesperson, was part of a high profile, basically high profile anti-government activist. Could you imagine if the Russian embassy in Ottawa was the base or a base for the convoy protesters? And that the spokesperson for the Russian embassy in Ottawa was uh, was a uh, prominent anti-Trudeau activist that helped overthrow the government. Now, eight years later, if that was the case, that would be context that would be very important. Let's just say, for instance, that after the coup uh, in Canada, this mythical mythical coup that the Ottawa convoy truckers uh, uh, instigated with the backing of the Russian embassy, uh, that then Quebec seceded from the country. And then there was a war between uh, elements of Quebec and the rest of the country. Well, that that's context that should be reported on if we talk about then a you know then an invasion, just on the pretext of defending Quebec, which is what the Russian government did, pretext in defending the the eastern Donbass uh, republics. That's context that should be you know widely discussed or would be widely discussed, but but our media just ignores it, right? It's like as if what happened, what Canada did in 2014 in the coup, is just it's not part of the picture. Um, and so it's, of course, our, you know, the, the, the work of activists, independent media uh, uh, to discuss these matters and to force these matters and to do it in part so the Canadian government doesn't up the ante even further, right? What Russia's done is wrong, but it could get even worse, right? And we don't want our government to make this even worse. We don't want even more expansion to NATO. We don't need more Canadian troops on Russia's border, which just increase the likelihood of of uh, of conflict. Um, uh, so yes, it's a it's a very uh, troubling situation, and, and unfortunately, Canada has played a, a, a negative role um, uh, in it. Thank you, Eve. Um, we have a you know clearly these um, clearly these uh, interventions are all linked, and um, we have a question from Andre, who talks about how Vijay Prashad recently admonished um, Canadians for having such a disconnect. Um, between our foreign policy practices and, uh, and is wondering how we can change these practices if so few Canadians are aware. And, um, you know, and to this, I would just sort of add, you know, what, what is really driving Canada's foreign, foreign policy in Latin America? Well, I, I just say that, I mean, I think I, I think what I, I mentioned previous, I think two things are driving Canadian foreign policy in Latin America, which is support for empire, the U.S. empire, and uh, support for Canadian corporate interests. Um, unfortunately, that is the problem, right? The problem, this is so much of this is an information battle. First of all, a lot of people don't care that much. They, they view it as distant, far from their lives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's only part of the story. Uh, if, that, if it wasn't, if people really didn't care, then the media, the dominant media, wouldn't have any problem openly saying that Canada helped overthrow the elected government in Haiti in 2004. We organized this meeting where we, we brought together the forces that would plot the coup. Uh, they wouldn't have any problem saying that, that you know, most of the world opposes this campaign against the Venezuelan government, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that they have to either suppress this information or wrap it in a whole bunch of sort of like propaganda or, or, or confusion is be precisely because they know that if people actually understood what was going on, they'd be you know, horrified or uh, against what the Canadian government is doing. Um, but that, but so the battle is so much of it is an information battle. And that's of course why, you know, the work that Camille is doing with independent media from uh, Bolivia and trying to get that out in in the English language to to uh, 
to you know audiences in in you know North America and elsewhere that can then use that information to you know put pressure on their government to not try to overthrow the Bolivian government in 2019 or and or other uh, uh, instances. Um, but it, but it, you know it's activism, right? It's it, how do you how do you force these things into the agenda? Uh, uh, you know there's there we can you know write things ourselves. We can occupy offices of politicians. We can. Uh, financially support uh, independent media. We can uh, share articles from independent media. We can talk about. I mean, there's, right? There's there's tons of things we can sign petitions. There's tons of things we can do. Um, but it's about you know taking the time, taking the energy. First part is of course information, uh, but then uh, getting organized. Thank you. So we have a question from uh, Nino. Um, who's wondering about the uh, movement demanding the freedom of Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab. Um, and he says, you know, this movement is growing, um, but he has not seen anything from the Canadian government. Has the Trudeau government reacted at all? And if not, why not? Well, I feel sure. like Nino might be the expert on this, not, not us, but um, I haven't seen any, I don't recall seeing any reaction um, from the Trudeau regime on this um, at all, but uh, it's a very important, um, it's a very important case. And one of the things that I uh, didn't mention in my quick little opening there is, um, you know, the, the other way in which uh, the United States specifically has been intervening in Latin America and Canada piggybacks on this is through, you know, through its agencies on the ground, NGOs, uh, we can't, you know, speak about this without mentioning the presence of churches and other organizations, but largely through the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration of the United States. And this is very crucial because, you know, in every single um, instance when they were trying the United States and anyone else who piggybacks and joins them in their imperialist crusade has tried to demonize a Latin American or Caribbean government. They have tried to at one point or another frame them as um, some sort of uh, peace in the you know, narco establishment that moves drugs and produces drugs from Latin America to the north, largely just to the United States, because everyone in the United States is on drugs, at least in comparison with, um, you know, other countries, including poor countries and countries or countries, you know, where people have a lot of so socioeconomic problems, a lot of inequality, even that being the case, a country like um, the United States has a very large population on both illicit drugs and prescription drugs. And so in the case of Alex Saab, I just think it's very important to say that, you know, the reason why he's being, uh, that he's been demonized and that he's being held hostage there, um, kidnapped by the United States after being, um, after being uh, arrested um, and held in Cape Verde and then extradited was because of the ways in which he was, uh, you know, the, the diplomat who was in charge of you know uh, of of connecting Venezuela with Iran um, and other countries in order to try to circumvent and overcome these unilateral sanctions, these coercive measures which make it impossible for Venezuelan authorities to purchase the much needed food, medicine, and other urgent supplies. And so, because of that important. Iran was absolutely critical, was one of the most important pieces. And if you ask a lot of people um, in Venezuela, people who've watched the situation very closely, they say it's Iran, not China and Russia, uh, but Iran, which saved Venezuela because it saved its oil sector by um, sending and integrating a number of uh, you know, spare parts um, and because of the way in which Venezuela was no, not able to get the parts it needed to be able to produce its oil, um, that it moved over to the system that Iran uses and was therefore be able, able to not only get um, oil from Iran, but begin to restart its own operations there on Venezuelan soil. So, you know, not only were they helping with, with oil, but they were all with fuel, they were also helping with food. And so it was in the transaction um, in which 
Alex Saab, Venezuelan diplomat, who's also a Colombian citizen, was trying to get food for Venezuela, that he was arrested. Now the United States you know, media campaign against Saab is saying that he was some sort of DEA informant, which is absolutely not true. And the reason we know it's not true is because obviously, you know, Venezuela has communication with him through his lawyer and family, but also because they tortured him brutally, both in Cape Verde and the United States. And that's not the way they treat their DEA um, informants, as we know, because we've seen many traders in Venezuela and other Latin American countries who've gone on to live very nicely in countries like Spain, the UK, the United States, and elsewhere, um, and that's not how they're treated. So, you know, um, this is a very important point as well, you know, is to, you know, pay attention uh, to the actual facts um, as uh, these investigations have shown us, um, these reports that are done annually by the United Nations, um, by the European Union in collaboration with different governments, and the fact that the top producer of drugs in our region continues to be those that are most closely um, aligned with Ottawa and Washington, which is uh, Colombia, formerly uh, the regime of Juan Orlando Hernandez in Honduras, um, and that you know these uh, complete slander campaigns um, are absolutely false against the other countries, which in the case of particularly Nicaragua and Bolivia have done an outstanding job of combating transnational criminal organizations and the drug trade. Thank you so much, Camila, for that uh, very, very broad and generous answer. I'm gonna direct the next question um, to you as well. We've been hearing a lot about, you know, can, uh, what are Canadian thoughts on um, you know, various matters and policies and, you know, someone who's asking a question, uh, Owen, what do you think public opinion in Latin America um, and perhaps especially in Bolivia is towards Canada? You know, like people are very um, like, I don't know if it's like naive or forgiving, uh, but people really just think that most countries um, in the exterior, uh, you know, obviously they have they have some understanding of the in interventionist policy um, and actions taken by the United States. But on a whole, um, I think they have very positive relations. And Canada, of course, as you all know, is a country that um, takes in a large, relatively compared to its neighbors, uh, number of. Um, of immigrants um, allows people to work and come and visit on a temporary ba basis and um, a lot of people have their connections there their family members there and then they've been able to go there and so people think uh, very positively the only um, area in which um, every country of the global south not just latin america and the caribbean but also my comrades in asia and africa um, the only point that they always harp on that canada is known for is of course its multinational corporations uh, that go in and displace people um, and, uh, you know, and just commit atrocities against the indigenous peoples um, and their resources and territories, um, you know, to, to uh, advance those mining projects. Unfortunately, the connection is not always made with those mining projects and those corporations and the government of Canada. Thank you. So we're uh, running short on time. Our, um, our webinar is uh, coming to an end. We've had a lot of questions um, for mostly for Camilla, but also for Eve about your thoughts on various um, Latin American leaders and elections coming up. So I think I'm just gonna group a couple of them together. And uh, if you could share any of your thoughts um, on some of these, uh, some of these leaders and, and, uh, and, and uh, candidates and races that are happening, that would be great. So someone is wondering if you could uh, talk more about the referendum in Chile, Camilla, and what your thoughts are um, on uh, Colombian presidential candidate Gustavo Petro. Um, there's someone who's asking uh, if we could hear a little bit more about Nicaragua. And, um, and, uh, and again, another question about uh, Gabriel Boric of Chile. And, uh, and former FARC political prisoner Ingrid Betancourt uh, trying to run for president. So if you have 
any thoughts on any of, uh, of, of those places? Um, I think our audience would love to hear your, hear your thoughts. Okay, I'll try to be very brief. Um, on Nicaragua, I think uh, I would encourage you to follow our social media, Castro News, because um, over the last several months, um, in the end of 2021, the beginning of this year, um, I made three trips to Nicaragua and I've done a lot of interviews with a lot of different people. And a lot of them are quite long and extensive and detailed. So it's a lot of work to translate these, uh, to subtitle the videos or to turn them into articles, but it's something I'm actively working on doing. But some of them have already been published to our social media, our YouTube, our website. Um, you can find them on Twitter and Facebook as well. And you know, I've spoken to a lot of people uh, representing a lot of different things, um, but you know, it's been very uh, educational for myself to be able to speak to people who look over the um, economic planning and the economic policy of Nicaragua. And, you know, for so long, I've heard the testimonies and spoken to regular Nicaraguans about the way in which their lives have improved substantially and the conditions which they live in under the Sandinista government because of its economic policies. But now I've been able to speak to uh, the finance minister, um, another minister who is uh, uh, of family planning and cooperatives. And, um, you know, I think this is, this is exactly the reason why Canada and the United States and other countries have been attacking Nicaragua, because it directly confronts uh, the capitalist model that we're also accustomed to in other countries and provides an alternative. And it's an extremely successful alternative. It has shown more success in a smaller amount of time than we've seen in any other country, um, including unfortunately Cuba and Venezuela, which have been absolutely, uh, you know, devastated or harmed by the unilateral course of measures. Um, and, you know, Nicaragua has found many ways um, to, uh, you know, circumvent the issues having to do with being a small economy, um, and everything else. They are a country that is largely food sovereign. So if any country tries to, you know, starve them into submission, they won't be able to do so because they produce all of their own food. And the government provides a lot of, uh, a lot of subsidies and loans uh, to women and the, the women heads of households so that they can start their own businesses. So they can do things like sell poultry, like, you know, uh, sow beans or any other uh, things like that so that they can participate not only in, uh, you know, the local markets and sell their goods and contribute to, you know, national production, but also the government is helping them through its various institutions to bring the standard of these products up so that a small, uh, a small cooperative of women can actually sell their, uh, their products to Scandinavia and be able to, to help their own communities in that way. There's just uh, a very long list of uh, government strategies and initiatives to try to uh, empower people to empower themselves economically. It's not a bunch of uh, just handouts by the government. It's helping people help themselves. And it's a very strong economy. And we have some very great interviews that you can look into on that. Um, let me just see really quickly what else. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what the process looks like in terms of the constitutional referendum process in Chile. And I would recommend uh, Pablo Vivanco, who is a Chilean Canadian. Um, and I think uh, he, he does some uh, writing and some columns and some media outlets and is of course an organizer there in Toronto and he's a very good reference for Chile. Um, we've shared we've, we've shared sound bites from him on Castro News before. And what was the last thing? There's one um, other. There was a, yeah, people were interested in hearing about, um, hold on one second. Colombia. Colombia. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, Colombia is going to, because the elections are taking place this year, the presidential elections, there is a pact, an agreement between all of the leftist uh, political parties who are going to be supporting Gustavo Petro. Gustavo Petro is another uh, Gabriel Boric. He's someone who is not um, obviously an anti-imperialist. He's no socialist. And he is someone who has on many issues parroted the line of Washington, including specifically on Venezuela. 
And so, you know, this is a huge problem because he is the leading candidate, but he is to the right of the sectors who are support supporting him. There are many revolutionary uh, important organizations in uh, Colombia, uh, campesinos, indigenous people, Afro-descendant people, and other uh, urban social movements of women, feminists, uh, and other uh, youth uh, university students, for example, who um, you know have very good um, um, ideologies in terms of you know what they believe uh, Colombia needs. They've been very much against the uh, war on Venezuela from Colombia, and they want to see an end to the narco paramilitary state of Ivan Duque and Uribe. So that being said, uh, this sort of centrist candidate, Gustavo Petro, will likely uh, win, win the race uh, with all the support he's had for, for a very long time. And because of the total lack of popularity um, of Ivan Duque, uh, it's worth having another session on. A hundred percent. We'd love to have you back. Um, so I'm just going to end with uh, just two final questions that I'm going to just lump together. One is kind of the negative and one is the positive. So Errol wants to know, to what extent does the Bolivarian revolution um, and grassroots social movements in places like Venezuela and Bolivia, the target um, of US and Canadian governments. And then to flip that around um, and really answer either of them, what could a positive foreign policy in Latin America look like? So I'd love to hear your brief thoughts on that before uh, we close our session for today. Eve, did you wanna take a turn and then I'll maybe yeah. add something? <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that realistically, uh, Canadian policy towards Latin America is is so oriented towards uh, empire and corporate interests that to, that to imagine a um, a solidaristic foreign policy in the short or medium term is is not really plausible. I think mostly what we want is less Canada's involvement. I think somewhere down the line changes within Canadian economic, cultural, political life, fundamental changes that that could change and Canada could have a more solidaristic uh, foreign policy. But in the short term, what we need to be focused mostly on is uh, stop the interventions, trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela, Bolivia, uh, stop working so hard on behalf of Canadian mining companies, stop pushing a you know global kind of neoliberal model uh, uh, et cetera et cetera yeah exactly that I have little more to add except that you know if Canada is going to be issuing interventionist statements and show grave concern about some of the issues and happenings that are taking place here they should start with uh, you know denouncing the ways in which the United States has used, uh, you know, both the Venezuelan opposition um, and other right wing forces connected to Ivan Duque have used paramilitaries and used uh, mercenaries in a way that has been tracked not only by leftist anti imperialist media, but also by right wing and Miami media uh, to wage a war on the shores of Venezuela and in other countries. This is something very concerning because, you know, these. Uh, different organizations, not only the, you know, direct government agencies of the United States and Canada, but other NGOs and other organizations and individuals, wealthy right-wing individuals, are continuing to funnel money into Latin America in order to destabilize the country, uh, and, and destabilize different countries, and in order to intervene in more stealthy ways, much of the time, it's very uh, much invisible. And so, you know, these are the sorts of things Canada could be denouncing. They could be denouncing the, uh, the intervention of other countries um, and, you know, calling for, uh, for these countries to, to completely stay out of the situation. Um, and so, yeah, exactly as, exactly as was said, um, you know, the US or Canada absolutely has no place, um, you know, sticking their heads or their noses into these situations around Latin America and is not offering any sort of help whatsoever. Um, you know, what Canadian people need to be calling for is for Canada to get its hands off of Latin America. Um, there's absolutely no way in which, um, you know, with the uh, 
you know, with the rare exception of uh, weather events uh, related to climate change um, and the volatility of these weather related events that we're going to be seeing in the Caribbean and Latin America, um, you know, wherein Canada has the opportunity to provide some sort of aid to these countries, I can't see any other reason why Canada needs to step foot. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you both for such a lively and detailed discussion. Um, I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has learned a ton. Um, thank you. I just want to thank you for helping to raise our consciousness as well um, around all of these issues. And thanks for your writing, for your activism, and for share, sharing so generously your tremendous analysis. Um, so it's been a great event. I just want to thank again our incredible panelists, Eve and Camilla. Please find out more about Camilla's work um, at uh, Kausishan News. Um, the, uh, the link is posted in the chat. You can also support them, become uh, join the Patreon. Um, you can also find out more about Eve's work at eveangler.com. Lots and lots and lots of articles and analysis on Canadian foreign policy. And he's written 12 books as well, um, mostly on Canadian foreign policy. So again, if you like events like these, please do consider making a donation to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute at foreignpolicy.ca slash donation. There's also an action that you can take a recent letter writing campaign where we called on Foreign Minister uh, Melanie Jolie to remove its sanctions, uh, lay the Lima Group to rest and stop recognizing Juan Guaido. So you can find that on our, our website. There's a link to that also in the chat there. Please do take action. I want to thank our co-sponsor, the Canadian Latin America Alliance, Pablo Vivanco, who was uh, mentioned by Camila at one point, is, uh, is a member of that group. Um, and thanks to our audience for joining us um, in great numbers and for your excellent questions. And, um, and again, thank you, Camila. Thank you, Eve. That's it for our event tonight. Good night, everyone. Peace. Bye-bye. Thank you. Happy Carnival. If anyone else is celebrating, we're celebrating here in uh, Bolivia this long weekend. Happy Carnival. Thanks, Bianca. Take care. Take care.